Uh, we want to welcome the folks from the Girl Scout Museum to tonight's lecture and thank them for uh, helping Dee with her research. Uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful. And if you ever want to get together and do a collaborative uh, undertaking with the society, we're open to everyone, uh, all organizations to, to participate in that. And I, I do have to ask, I was given some information today uh, that this may actually be the birthday, uh, happy birthday opening day for the Girl Scouts at Cedar Hill back in 1923. Is that correct? Okay. As far as I know, I believe it is. Okay. So what we're, we're, wow. we're we wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> That's great timing. <laughs> and it, well, it really did work out and I couldn't let it pass without that. But um, tonight's speaker is a 40 year Waltham resident who's been active in several community groups over the years, including the Waltham Fields Community Farm, the Waltham Land Trust, Grow Community Gardens and Watch Inc. She's a retired public school teacher, an avid gardener and an art maker. And then amongst other things, I could probably go on for hours. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, rather than keep you any longer, I'm going to introduce you to Dee Cricker and turn her, turn you over to her. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank the Waltham Historical Society and Wayne in particular for agreeing to invite me to give this presentation. We talked, I think, over a, a year and a half ago. It was at the last meeting, I think, that you held at the... Um, uh, at the Grove Street uh, School, um, and several of us who, who were aware that the, we were coming upon the centennial of Cornelia Warren's death um, next month, were thinking of how nice it would be to pause and look back and maybe have an, an exhibit and do some research. Um, and all of these things were, of course, um, dreams, but <laughs> We've managed to get some things done. We, we may be in the, the near future because we could continue this um, commemoration over the next year, be able to share more about what we know um, and look for more artifacts. But the problem has been that a lot of the libraries and our archival um, repositories have been closed to us. So we have only been able to use the information that we can find uh, by digging online, and there is quite a lot uh, available. Uh, and also um, from the Girl Scouts Museum and the Girl Scout um, folks and ladies who have helped out there, I want to thank you very much for making available a lot of original photos, um, which you'll see in the slides tonight, and, uh, and some other artifacts and, and information from letters and so forth. I want to especially thank Betty McKenzie. She has been kind of a co uh, project person uh, on this effort and uh, has um, also helped to um, mentor someone by the name of Avi Stein, Avi, Aviva Stein, who's doing um, a wonderful web project um, that will be a place for information about Cornelia to be housed as time goes on and more people can contribute to it and we can maybe build some sort of an archive all in one place so that we don't always have to dig up and uh, reinvent the wheel. So um, that's upcoming, that's a work in progress, <coughs> excuse me. And um, I also wanna thank a few other people, uh, also to say that the Girl Scouts are doing their own project with Leslie Sneden, or Sneden, I'm sorry, um, and inventorying the plants and the land uh, of the Warren estate. So that will be a published uh, mapping and all kinds of information about uh, the, the topography and the plants there, the inventory. So we look forward to seeing that. That's very exciting and it's a wonderful way to commemorate Cornelia Warren. Um, <clears throat> I also want to thank Marie Daly and Ann Clifford, Marie for her constant uh, support and um, and Anne for providing the references that she did early on, um, much of which I, I read, um, and just for their inspiration as professional historians. Um, and then I also want to thank my husband, David Cricker, who processed all these photos. And, and so let's get into it. Um, and I think what I'll, first, first a couple of questions for everyone. How, how do we assess a person's reputation? Uh, how do we decide who is a figure to honor or a woman who made a difference among all the women who've made differences? How do we measure 
the unknown hours that someone in the past has given to causes and conversations and committees and, and what they've done in terms of making decisions, important decisions about which way a committee might uh, act uh, or lead, about money given, about helping hands extended or small favors done. How do we value that a hundred years later? How do we assess the value of a healthy bottle of milk provided to a hungry neighborhood of infants and children? And some people suspect that that's why Cornelia started her dairy to help the immigrant families down in the South End of Boston and near and around the cities uh, that distributed her milk, received her milk. How does one evaluate the smell of or fragrance of a floral bouquet and the smile and the warm greeting upon meeting a blind, lonely immigrant, three flights up in a tenement left alone in the dark on a hot day? These were the kinds of things that I read in the Denison House journals of which there are some online. I have uh, copied a lot, maybe 100 or 150 pages of entries um, that indicated it was Cornelia was involved. Um, so I have a sampling of the record of what she did over the 30 years she was involved with Jenison House. Um, often the women residents there would go and distribute flowers uh, that they would collect from people in the suburbs to bring to the um, elderly and to the sick and the disabled in the tenements, just to make them feel a little better. Uh, and so did Cornelia do that as well as all of the many, many, many things they did. Uh, it's quite fascinating and I hope someday to transcribe the, that information so we'll know a little bit more and I can convey. My report has already um, been cut in half, so I'm leaving a lot out. So this is just kind of sharing an overview and a sampling of what we can glean from the records about Cornelia. But I think it's important to ask those questions because I think it's time to start to recognize what a remarkable woman she was. Um, she had the business sense that would contribute to stabilize an enterprise. And she had a home with provisions where she could support the mission. Her life was very integrated. What she did in um, Waltham, she carried on to Westbrook, Maine, where her father's mill was and into Boston and into Wellesley, as you'll see, she really had developed a network without the internet. She was networking constantly with family and friends. And matter of fact, I don't think there's anyone she didn't know when you look at the overlapping intersections. I started to do a Venn diagram of who knew who and starting with her will and working backwards. It's amazing. Um, so those are some of the questions. Um, and I think what we'll just start now is with a slideshow and, and let's get going with the introduction. A look back at Cornelia Warren 100 years after her death. And I'm gonna to try to get this working, um, sharing the screen, Rachel, here we go. You should be able to share the screen, I set it up. There you go, I see it. Yep. Beautiful. Okay. You can see your screensaver with a mountain. There it is. All righty. All right, here we go. June 4th, 2021 marks the centennial of the death of Cornelia Warren, a woman widely known in her time, but who is largely unknown today, despite leaving a significant legacy that has impacted generations of families. At the turn of the 20th century, Cornelia was one of the richest women in Massachusetts one who contributed much of the wealth she inherited from her father's paper manufacturing business to numerous charities and institutions. However, Cornelia did not passively dole out checks to worthy causes because she could afford to do so. Rather, her philanthropy was one component of her social activism that was a defining characteristic of a life grounded in religious convictions and enlightened moral philosophy. To quote from the beautiful eulogy written by her friend, poet, Catherine Lee Bates, who was the poet of the verse for America the Beauty, Beautiful, as you know. Quote, Cornelia Warren with all her wealth of possessions, accomplishments, opportunities was democratic to the core. She not only joyed 
to give, to share, but she craved human fellowship. Her large estate at Cedar Hill, with its farm and dairy, its gardens and orchards, carried a community of its own, and over them all her interest and care shone like a daily blessing. Cedar Hill, her native place, had been precious to her from earliest memories. Because she loved her home so well, she threw it open not only to her troops of friends, especially in their times of sorrow, illness, convalescence, need of any sort, and to their friends and to the waifs of whom they told her, but to her neighbors near and far, even rough boys who broke through the evergreen walls of the maze and knocked heads and arms off the marble statues. And what she was to Waltham, she was and more to Cumberland Mills, where she had been looked up to almost like a patron saint, unquote. Cornelia chose to use the advantages of her privileged life to alleviate inhumane conditions resulting from poverty, ignorance, poor health, and injustice. She committed her time to improving social welfare and advocating for progressive causes over decades. Her actions were integrated within a moral framework inherited from her family's religious values and traditions, but also one reflecting the intellectual culture and influence of her peers and mentors with respect to progressive social theories of her era. She was an intelligent, well-educated woman who was fully engaged in a broad range of activities that advances, advanced causes dear to her values and her heart. Over six decades, the arc of her life bridged many divides which she definitely navigated. Cornelia was uniquely positioned to bear witness to societal changes and the underlying tensions that resulted as her life straddled polarities that define the era agriculture, industry, rural, urban, rich, and poor. In addition to her family history, her life experiences ranged from extensive travel abroad to trips to Westbrook, Maine, where she engaged with mill workers and their families from an early age. Further, she deeply understood the cultural challenges of social status within her immediate family, for instance, with respect to educational attainment, health, gender roles, sexual orientation, and disability. All of those uh, were areas that her own family experienced some challenges, her brothers. The choices Cornelia made reconciling these cultural extremes resulted in significant and lasting contribution to the lives of thousands of persons continuing to the present day. Let's go to Waltham 1857. Here we are on Beaver Street. And Marie provided this map, um, 1854 map. And as you can see, uh, the red line points to Reverend Doris Clark and Hannah Clark, his wife's home, homestead. And on the right, Frederick Lawrence, uh, who was family, uh, for whom's family was named the Lawrence Meadow, there on Beaver Street across from the Waltham Field Station uh, is there. So in the year 1857, <clears throat> Waltham was a town on the cusp of profound social change that would permanently alter the course of its more than 200 year history as a traditional agricultural community. At that moment, four years before the start of the Civil War, the town of approximately 6,000 inhabitants paused to celebrate the ingenuity and productivity of its citizenry with a three day extravaganza agricultural industrial fair that featured only products that were made in Waltham. The recently formed <clears throat> Waltham Agricultural Library Association, later to be uh, under other names, the Farmers Club, but at that point, it was chaired by Cornelia's grandfather, the Reverend Doris Clark, who proposed a townwide fair to showcase the fruits of labor in agriculture, manufacturing, and manual crafts. In his remarks at the opening festivities, <clears throat> the inspirational Reverend Clark emphasized the unique equilibrium attained between traditional practices based on agriculture and innovative technology based on industry. Quote, Waltham, Mr. President, represents the three great departments of human industry, agriculture, manufacturers, and the mechanic arts. In equal in proportions perhaps more nearly equal than any other town in the Commonwealth. Consequently, it was fitting 
eminently fitting that the products of the plow, the loom, and the anvil should find as nearly as might be equal representation here. This feature of our exhi exhibition is somewhat unique for a town exhibition and adds not a little interest to the present occasion, end quote. In retrospect, the 1857 fair was likely the apex of Waltham's lengthy agrarian era as economic forces and technological innovation would fuel the rise of industrial manufacturing as the dominant production mode, eclipsing the primacy of agriculture behind the mechanized shadows of a growing industrial city. As Cornelia, as Cornelia matured, so did her hometown. When she turned 27 in 1884, Waltham incorporated as a city. And at her death, the city's population had increased fivefold to about 31,000 persons. Within her lifespan, major events impacting the course of history included the Civil War when she was just young, the Great Economic Panic and Depression of 1890-93, and World War I not to mention the pandemic, which by then was in her later life. Cornelia's family dynamic mirrored the changing social and cultural patterns occurring as a result of the Industrial Revolution and its consequences. Though rooted in the past, the Warrens branched out in innovative new directions, experimenting and challenging the status quo. Cornelia's life epitomized the challenges of opportunity and boundaries facing women of her day. She made herself relevant, took responsibilities, and held fast to her moral compass. On March 21st, 1847, born at her family's recently completed Victorian mansion on Beaver Street, she was born into wealth cre created from her industrious industrialist father, Samuel Dennis Warren. I'll refer to him as Dennis, <clears throat> as he was referred to in his own time. Her young life was very different from that of her parents who came from modest economic circumstances. Both parents were born and raised in rural settings with ancestries dating back to the original settlers of Massachusetts Bay Colony, many of whom settled within the Connecticut River Valley and the Worcester Hills. Her mother, Susan Cornelia Clark, was born in Blanford and her father, Samuel Dennis Warren, Dennis was born in Grafton, and this, this is his family homestead. There were small country villages just located 75 miles apart. Family bonds were strong among Cornelia's numerous relatives, a tradition she embraced as evidenced by numerous interactions with and support for family members, providing for some well beyond their death. Accounts indicate that Cornelia was well liked by her relatives with the nickname of Pussy to her siblings and Aunt Pussy to her nieces and nephews, each of whom received a gift of a piano upon marriage. Throughout her life, Cornelia socialized with extended family members as did her parents. She visited, entertained, traveled, and hosted social events at Cedar Hill, often driving her by herself the horse-drawn carriage or her self-propelled electric car to Clematis Station to pick them up. In addition to being a skilled horseback rider, Cornelia was one of the first women in the state to acquire a driver's license. The Warren Clark families were devout Congregationalists having descended from the Puritans with strong religious traditions forming the organizing principle that guided their lives. Born in West Hampton, Doris Clark was not thought strong enough to be a farmer, so he obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree from Williams College and subsequently completed a three-year graduate program at Andover Theological Seminary at the age of 23. While in seminary, Doris had a religious revelation that left him with a profound, profound belief in his need to serve God. His theological training was within the Orthodox Calvinist Christian tradition, of which he was a strict adherent until his death at the ripe age of 87 years. Known by some as the last of the Puritans, the ordained congregational minister, Reverend Clark, served as a church pastor for 18 years before he left the pulpit in Western Mass to devote his life to the writing of theological texts. Editor and proprietor of numerous publications that promulgated his fervent views, for instance, the New England Puritan, the Christian Alliance, 
and family visitor in the Christian times. By the time Cornelius' grandfather spoke at Waltham's Great Fair of 1857, his family had been living on Beaver Street for eight years. In his written genealogy, the ancestry and writings of the Reverend Doris Clark, Doctor of Divinity, written in 1876, which was the centennial of America, he proclaims that his early American ancestors came here to worship God. Quote, they were a part of the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay and not of the Pilgrims of Plymouth, unquote. Reverend Clark's conservative views represented a branch of religious thought that was hotly debated by advocates of a broader interpretation of Christianity in that era. One can only speculate how her devout grandfather's, her devout grandfather's prominence impacted young Cornelia. Though she remained closely affiliated with her family's congregational church roots, her social milieu and chosen friends represented a range of more progressive, if not radical, views in their interpretation of religious and social theory. Cornelius' brother Ned, Ed, Edward Perry, nicknamed Ned, wrote of Doris, quote, we always thought my grandfather conceded and we were not pained when Papa declined to republish his books, unquote. Cornelia and her four brothers would follow uniquely different paths than that of their parents and of each other. However, Cornelia's life exemplified the high moral principles and standards set forth by her parents and got, they guide, that guided her decisions and actions and bonded her to a community of extended family and friends who shared those values. In the Chronicle, a memorial of my mother published eight years after Susan's death in 1901, Cornelia reconstructs Susan's life based on the personal recollections of those who knew her and on contemporaneous letters between her parents, friends, and family. And there's Susan on the right and Dennis on the left. This was um, their, engage their engagement derog derog derogatory <laughs> photos um, in 1847. I should mention that Dennis had been previously engaged um, to a woman who died of um, a rheumatoid condition uh, about which he was quite distraught um, and that had happened a few years before his engagement to, to Susan. Cornelius' narrative about her mother is very nuanced and poetic at times, revealing a woman who has a high regard for the written word that is Cornelia's writing was pretty impressive. For example, in one passage about her mother, she, recall, she, recon, she recalls, my earliest memories of my mother are of a most thorough housekeeper, calm and equable with both children and servants, knowing where everything was and how everything should be cared for, dusting her powers herself, arranging flowers with a particular charm, and in every emergency, bringing timely treasures out of her storehouse. When she said a thing was not in a drawer, it certainly was not, as her method of hunting was to lift out each successive layer with unfailing care. And when I sometimes lay in her bed in the morning and watched her dress, the process seemed to me to partake of the calmness, the gentleness, and the inevitableness of the sunrise." Unquote. Cornelia's mother is described as a reserved, trusted friend who was self-effacing but deeply caring individual. She described herself as not naturally social, preferring to retire to the quiet of her room when social demands became too much for her. She did have lifelong friendships and she was viewed by her daughter as being calm and capable under duress. Susan endured several hardships as a young girl, a wife and a mother, including the death of her firstborn son, Josiah. When the Clark family moved to Boston when she was 16, she attended a series of private schools in Boston and Beacon Hill that offered her intellectual stimulation and social engagement. Eager to learn, Susan enjoyed her studies, including learning to play the piano and to sing. Susan was introduced to the, the man she married, Dennis Warren, by two of his sisters, Hannah and Sarah, who were schoolmates of Susan's in Boston. After a six month engagement, they were married on Dennis's 30th birthday. She was 22. When she, over the course of their lives, Susan and Dennis spent many months at a time apart as Dennis was away for health and or business reasons. 
Cornelia saw her mother as being cool, calm, and deliberate. She hints that Susan retained a distance from her children and writes, my mother was not emotional. She looked at her children with more impartial eyes than did Dennis. As her husband was often away tending to his business, Susan was responsible for the oversight and management of their Waltham Cedar Hill mansion, completed in the fall of 1855. <clears throat> it was a summer residence for many years as the family's primary residence was an ornately furnished Mount Vernon Street home purchased in 1863. Quote, the acquisition of Beacon Hill property marked the family's entry into Boston society. In fact, Susan Warren vied with Isabel Stewart Gardner for masterpieces that were then entering European art markets, unquote. Though her daughter appreciated fine decor and amenities, Cornelia candidly expressed her personal distaste for what she felt was her mother's extravagant spending, Cornelia. The writer of this biography, having been much affected by social theories, had often been in an extremely critical attitude when assisting at the purchase of picture or vase for large sums of money, unquote. By the time of her death in 1901 at age 76, Susan had amassed a significant collection of valuable art that was described in a catalog and sold at a two-day auction in New York City in 1903. Susan did contribute several artworks and financial support to the Museum of Fine Arts. Susan's um, will included uh, what would be today about $6 million worth of bequests to institutions. And um, it is quite amazing to see how generous she was with, and also how much money she had at her death and still left money for her children. At the mill in Westbrook, Susan's efforts were focused on improving the library for the workers and their families. She also commissioned the building of Cumberland Hall, this building. It's a large Queen Anne style Warren block, and referred to as a Warren block, in 1882, intended for community services and activities to benefit the citizens of the area. Susan endowed the Warren Memorial Foundation after her husband's death, and she bequeathed the foundation $50,000 in her will for the library and for educational purposes for the community. In as late as 2010, an award of $750,000 was given from the fund to repair the roof of the Westbrook Community Association. Susan made significant contributions to charitable organizations in her will. And once we get the website, we can post some of that for people to look at. Uh, this is also the building where Cornelia would fund a conversion of the third floor into a woman, into a gymnasium for the children uh, of, of Westbrook. And we'll hear more about that in a minute. So Dennis Warren, a self-made man, literally went from rags to riches when in 1854 he purchased the Amacongan Mill, renamed it the Cumberland Mills in Westbrook, Maine, launching a career that would elevate his family's status into the Boston Brahmin class of the Nouveau Riche. That same year, Warren, remember who became, be, uh, began life in Grafton, he started buying real estate in Waltham and ultimately acquiring in this area here, you can see the arrow pointing to in 1856, the mansion that they were building, which was finished in 1855. Uh, they ultimately acquired over 200 acres and consolidated a lot of the parcels here, including the Lawrence and some of the parcels across the street. So, uh, Samuel's father, John Warren, and his second wife, Susanna Grout, did some farming, had a grocery store with his wife, and he was a traveling salesman, uh, shoe salesman who peddled coarse leather shoes to field laborers and slaves in the South and the West Indies. John Warren died when Dennis was 11, and his mother died when he was 20 years of age. There were many deaths in uh, that family. Four of the children died of um, scarlet fever within four months before Dennis was born, if you can believe that. Um, 
Dennis attended a Quaker school in Groton and then began classical studies at Amherst Academy, but he withdrew before graduation because of health reasons. So he never obtained a college education that he, his mother had wished for him. In a letter written on the centennial of his father's death, his youngest son Fisk wrote that his father's chief interest was to benefit his fellow man and his pride was to conduct business honorably, to give worthy men worthy employment, to convert dirty useless rags into clean useful paper. Fisk also said that his father gave his wealth to education, quote, the lack of which he deplored in his own case, unquote, and what he thought would benefit the masses, lifting them from poverty, disease, and crime. So here we have a picture on the porch of Cedar Hill. I'm not quite sure what year this is. I think it's in the early 70s as Cornelia was 14 in 1871. And there she is looking maybe a couple years older. I think the boys, um, the one behind Susan, I believe that's Henry. And then I think Fisk is on the floor and uh, on, the, on his knees. And I think that might be Ned um, posing stiffly behind him. After leaving Amherst, Dennis, at the age of 15, moved to Boston in 1832 to work for Grant and Daniel, a company that sold paper and mill supplies. He worked from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. for $50 a year, and as an office boy, he lived in an attic with other boys under harsh conditions. Six years later, in recognition of his success learning all the aspects of the business, Dennis was offered a junior partnership position in the company as a salesman, working on commission, selling paper and supplies. He began to travel to purchase rags for the small paper mill that the firm, Grant and Daniel, bought in Pepper, Pepperel Mass in 1853. But a year later, Dennis, on his own, without their, uh, the company's authorization, purchased a small paper mill on the Presumpscot River in Westbrook, Maine for $28,000, for which he had to go to the bank for a loan. Okay. This is the um, railroad, and I'm going to sort of scroll through some of the mill uh, pictures of Westbrook during that period that... Um, they were building out the mill structures, as I read. Uh, they would have carried their supplies in and out on the rails here. As a businessman, man, Dennis was a workaholic who had persistent health issues, including chronic headache, fatigue, and other physical ailments that were alleviated by his travel to different climates. Described as a congenial boss <clears throat> who treated everyone with respect, Warren invested in cutting edge technology and innovation to improve the paper manufacturing process. And by 1870, the mill produced over $1.8 million. That would be $36 million revenue today. Warren's transformative idea was to combine shredded wood pulp from the local timber mills in the river with the cotton rags to revolutionize paper production, resulting in lower prices and increased demand. This would have digested the, the wood pulp in the mill of this particular machine. It's called a soda digester. By 1880, the Warren Enterprise in Westbrook had become the largest paper manufacturing company in the world and the source of a sizable family income. The expansion of the mill required a significant workforce and upgraded infrastructures to accommodate the increased workforce. Warren contributed land, money, and resources to support the needs of the community, including building 400 units of company housing for mill families in what is considered the best example of 19th century planned industrial community in Maine at Cumberland Mills. Hmm. This don't seem to be in order. When the Warren Church was formed in 1868, Dennis contributed half of the budget, the furnishings, and an imported Italian rose window, uh, window for the church and the land. So this is uh, a float with his papers being um, promoted. This was a float to commemorate the centennial of Westbrook Parade. 
Here's an example of a, a late um, example of some of his um, paper. Warren uh, established a mutual relief fund for disabled mill employees and families of deceased workers. He offered low interest loans for home buyers and for education. He offered a profit sharing plan, a pension system, and eight, one of the first to institute an eight hour day, and he refused to employ children. He was considered a pioneer of welfare capitalism. Cornelia writes that her father's life was one of purity, integrity, and honor, of heartfelt benevolence, and that if a full account of his gifts to causes and institutions was made, the proportion of his income would be high. At a memorial service in the Warren Congregational Church at his death, dozens of workers testified to his honorable character. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry you can't read all of those. Um, uh, memberships there, uh, but I will read some of them. Here is a portrait uh, in the Davis Museum, Wellesley College, uh, by a French painter, Alexander Cabanel, when uh, Cornelia was about 1314, 1871. Uh, partial list of memberships. It's very hard to track down everything, but she was a member of the Consumers League, the Dennis House, the Fatherless and Widow Society, the International Institute for Girls in Spain. All, most of these she gave, contributed money, but these are where she was also active. The Mass Horticultural Society, the Milk and Baby Hygiene Association, the Thursday Evening Club, uh, which was an association of Taylorists, which she co-founded with Catherine Coleman, uh, and many, many more. <clears throat> so the children were educated, the Warren children, at the best private schools at the time. And the children attended uh, for, her, for the, well, let me go back to this uh, specifically. She intended Miss Gage's school, Miss Hubbard's school, and she was tutored by someone called Nathaniel Hooper. Um, in 1876, she passed with an excellent record the preliminary examination for women given under the auspices of Harvard College. However, Harvard had no program for women at that time, though efforts were underway to create a parallel program for women taught by Harvard faculty, known as the Harvard Annex. It was in 1879, it was a forerunner of what became Radcliffe College. By comparison to Cornelia, all four brothers graduated from Harvard College and each was recognized for their various professional or scholarly accomplishments during their lifetime. Instead, Cornelia pursued private home study with, with a focus on philosophy for three years with professors George Herbert Palmer of Harvard and George Holmes Howison of MIT, each of whom received accolades over their long careers from their many devoted students for excellence in teaching. Um, this is a picture, uh, these are pictures, they're not, you can't see them too well, but what they are are the certificates that women would have received, young women, had they taken the Harvard Annex course and gotten tutored by the male faculty uh, on a street in Cambridge that was not the university, and they would have had to take some of these tests and basically had a parallel education and ended up by getting uh, a certificate. Uh, and Cornelia didn't actually, that we know of, get a certificate of instruction. She had more individualized instruction through the tutors, but uh, Palma was a uh, tutor for the women's annex. Records indicate that Cornelia had many contacts within the Harvard and Wellesley community of academics through her own association and that of her brothers. For example, she became friends with her brother Henry's mentor, Professor Charles Landman, a scholar and co-editor of the Harvard Oriental series of ancient religious texts. She was also friends with MIT economics professor Davis Dewey, who came to the Denison house for dinner with her one night, who was John Dewey's younger brother. A friend of her brother Fisk, uh, John, uh, Professor D Dewey was, with whom she dined at Denison. <clears throat> Reading through the lists of trustees and directors of the many organizations with which Cornelia was involved, one sees a lot of the same well-connected people. Here is uh, the Wellesley College records uh, uh, in the year 1900. You can see that arrow points to Cornelia from Boston uh, as an officer at Wellesley, where she was a trustee for 13 years. And uh, you can also recognize 
perhaps some other names there. Um, Alice Freeman Palmer, who was the president of, uh, and a good friend of Cornelius, president of Wellesley, uh, until she married uh, Palmer, who was Cornelius instructor. Um, and uh, there may be some other people there who you might recognize. Carolyn Hazard, we will get to in a minute. Uh, so let's skip to the um, letter that Cornelia wrote that is in the Harvard archives. Uh, what's interesting is it, it's a handwritten letter. I didn't have permission to actually uh, post it, but um, the photocopy that I have has the um, letterhead Cedar Hill Waltham Mass imprinted on probably worn paper. And um, she writes in script the following to Miss Hazard in 1910, July 13th. Dear Miss Hazard, at the meeting of the trustees yesterday, I learned your decision and I want to express to you the loss that I feel has befallen our college. There was but one feeling of great loss, deep regret and hesitation and awe on the threshold of the unknown. You have seen the college grow and expand under your guiding hand in many ways, many unknown ways too. You have added to its perfections. You have stood bravely for it in its hour of need and thrown yourself, your time and strength and health and your substance unsparingly into the balance to secure its development. The memory of what you have done will not fail to be a comfort to you and the beautiful college itself will never forget you. Do not answer this, but just accept it as one of the many expressions you will receive of an affectionate regard, faithfully yours, Cornelia Warren. I found that a very poignant letter, very telling about Cornelia's personality that she'd go home, she'd write the letter the next day. She would not want even an answer. She was, you know, just giving, you know, a candid, um, simple, quick expression of her thanks and her uh, sorrow in seeing um, seeing the resignation happening, but also it gives you an idea of how much she really respected the college. Though she did not attend college herself, Cornelia socialized and collaborated with a milieu, milieu of highly educated women from middle to upper class families, many of whom were first generation graduates from the newly established women's colleges of the Northeast including Wellesley, Bryn Mawr, Smith, Vassar, and this is one of the first Radcliffe classes from 1883, when they finally got organized. These women, many of whom remained unmarried or who had female partners called a Wellesley or a Boston marriage, bonded in response to their shared view of the need to address social issues, including the need to empower women through the vote, to increase educational and economic opportunities and to advance social welfare policies and programs to address injustices. Wellesley professors Catherine Lee Bates in literature, Catherine Coleman, history and economics, Emily Green Greenbach in economics and sociology, and Vita Scottler in English literature were prominent and among Cornelia's friends and contemporaries. The progressive era in uh, responses to the Gilded Age abuses of capitalism included not only those from the religious community, such as the social gospel movement, but also from the organized labor sector that sought to redistribute wealth through economic reform. Ideas espoused in Europe gained traction in the US, and many of those in Cornelius Circle had adopted the new socioeconomic theories having attended lectures and studied contemporary writings on their trips abroad. They returned with a heightened sense of purpose to create change in light of the dismal conditions they witnessed in America's growing cities and factories. From the late 1800s on, um, 1880s on, many of these women who had restricted ability to work once married became active in the College Settlement Association, the labor movement, the suffragist movement, the, and the international peace movement through the decades of the, of the turn of the century. Um, this is a uh, listing of some of the um, bequests that Cornelia made. It's an alphabetical order, just to give you a sense of um, the first whole group of missionary to foreign missionaries were also um, groups that are institutions that her mother gave to. Um, so those are all congregational related affiliations. And many of those um, groups helped um, 
in terms of fighting the um, for the cause of abolition during the Civil War, and then to fight for um, and to help establish um, historical Black colleges and universities in the South. So um, you will see in her mother's will a bequest to Roberts College and Atlanta College. Those were um, specifically uh, for um, education of African American uh, youth. Um, I tried to understand why Cornelia would give to some of these um, other groups, the International Institute for Girls in Spain, which she actually visited in uh, Europe. Um, so most of these were uh, around education, focused on education and um, uh, philanthropy um, to help people who were in need. Uh, you see the Waltham Hospital got some money. This is by no means all of the money. Uh, this was just in her will. We have no way of knowing how much she contributed to organizations in her lifetime. That is still something that needs to be discovered. Uh, so it would be very hard to evaluate. This amount of money would be equivalent to about two and a quarter million dollars today. And it's not all of her will uh, because she obviously bequeathed the land, land as well. Uh, that Waltham um, was gifted, Waltham groups. Um, to continue, the, the women also worked for universal public education and health policy reform to ensure the safety of food production. Many contributed to liberal churches that supported the abolitionist movement, as I mentioned. Her social circles also included wider and wider networks of family and friends, some in New York, some in Connecticut, some in Chicago, some in St. Louis, uh, who were affiliated with these um, missionary groups and church groups. Uh, she was a supporter of the Museum of Fine Arts and the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Her education also included her world travels where she learned about various cultures firsthand and she became fluent in French in Paris. Unlike her mother, who was immersed in the visual arts, Cornelia was an accomplished pianist and a patron of the musical arts. She, and she integrated her love of music with her social activism, participating as a performer, a patron, or supporter of benefit concerts and musical productions for Denison House. There are numerous citations of her um, being a patroness of a concert, a chamber music concert, in support of the Denison House, or a folk music concert. Sometimes she played entertainment at Denison House for the neighborhood at night. Two of the most, um, by the way, this is the women's basketball team of Westbrook, Maine, um, to which Cornelia had, uh, as I mentioned before, contributed uh, the third floor of the, um, of the, um, let me back. Whoops, going the wrong way. That's a preview. Okay, what I'm entering here is her connection to Westbrook Factory and how she shared her mother's interest in um, providing for the Westbrook community, establishing a foundation at her death and uh, after her mother's death, contributing recreational facilities, a gymnasium, a pool, um, helping out at the library. Um, so Westbrook and at the Mills uh, and Denison House were two significant influences on her educational development as she interacted with the mill workers in their families and with the immigrant families. Uh, so she got a window into what it was like uh, at that end of the spectrum. When she visited the mills with her father and also after her parents' deaths, she provided uh, some ideas and she, she got to know the people and she became very um, vested in contributing, they really, as I mentioned in Kathleen Lee Bates's um, eulogy, they thought of her as a patron saint. This team was formed in 1905. Uh, and the following year, Cornelia provided a similar gymnasium for Portland, Maine. And she paid for instruction for the boys and the girls there. In 1905, she had a large 500,000 gallon swimming tank built over the river, the Persumskit River, in order that the children who were swimming everywhere in the river would have a safe place to swim. She left $100,000 uh, in the community foundation on her, of her name, specified for community's use, and she left land valued in Westbrook at $25,000. To this uh, day recently, the 
Cornelia Warren Community Association has funded numerous projects, including uh, what's currently listed as a supporter of the Intercultural Community Center to support and empower lives of immigrants by providing health, social, and educational support. That's today, that is online. As far as the Denison House, um, we will go into some sampling of the, let me see what we're doing here, of some of the annual reports. Excuse me while I turn on my light. This is the year 1919, and I'm just gonna kind of scroll through here. You'll see she's listed as a director in this annual report. This is the Tyler Street complex. She helped to fund some of the addition buildings, but at the time of her death, she held the mortgages um, on, I believe, four buildings and uh, gifted those buildings, gifted the mortgage to be paid up at her death. Uh, she also helped to contribute to so many other uh, aspects of the Denison House on Tyler Street, the settlement house. She was intimately involved with the Boston branch of the Co College Settlement Association movement, where she and an extraordinary group of college educated women worked to alleviate the horrific problems facing the immigrants in the South End. Her success um, and her work on Denison House over 30 years, I think can't be underestimated. She was not one of the most vocal, most political, most visible people, but she was like the backbone of the Denison House, as far as I can see. She provided the stability and the resources, including her savvy business and operational management skills, her social networking. She always brought people in to see what they were doing. Mrs. Fisk Warren, her sister-in-law, hosted a Christmas party there. You see so many overlapping um, uh, networks there. She provided financial support, fundraised, did publicity, and was involved directly in routine daily activities. Um, in the end, at the end of 1893 to 1894, it looked as though she might have even been a resident there for three or four months. She was there every day, and uh, that would not have been unusual. They tried to have like commitments from the college women to stay for at least three months, a period of time. And in the day books, her she initial uh, she initializes a lot of the. Um, ongoing activities, records them, and she's involved in them. Here are some of the uh, committees. She's on the Ways and Means Committee usually, or she's a treasurer, she's on the Finance Committee. She's a general contributor here. This is the same book. Um, this is on the left, what a lot of the day records look like. You have to kind of really, really strain your eyes to figure out um, when you're reading them if you can read the, the, the handwriting, some are illegible, but this one says, Miss Warren, this was August 8th, uh, 14th, 1902, Miss Warren's friends and Mr. So-and-so um, came and gave a very fine musical entertainment, piano and violin for the evening. Uh, the next one is a little insert uh, announcing um, a meeting of the College Settlement Association, uh, including speakers, from Philadelphia and from um, New York coming. And you can see Catherine Coleman, Cornelia Warren's name was there. And here was a wonderful um, flyer that I found on a video about Denison House um, broadcasting 1917, uh, a carnival of country fair at Cedar Hill in aid of Denison House. Other things that, that Cornelia did um, besides serving on these committees uh, and participating in daily routines, she was particularly interested, it seems, in the stamp club savings book that encouraged the, the children and the um, workers to open a savings account. And that would be so Cornelia, paying, um, being sure that they put a little aside. And she would bring those books to the bank. Um, she would set up the library, she would pay visits to the neighbors, do the record keeping, as I mentioned. This, um, uh, this was in 1917, there was also a fair at Cedar Hill in 1916 that raised the equivalent of $36,000 today. Cornelia's business acumen likely learned from her father's business skills and perhaps her mother's management of household operations, as well as the family's increasing wealth and expenditures, 
much of what went to philanthropic causes, which was a rich source of knowledge imparted to Cornelia. For many of the organizations with which she held a role, she was treasurer or involved with the finances, as I said. Uh, she was probably recruited as well because people knew she could contribute and had some money. Uh, matter of fact, that was why she was originally recruited for the settlement house, it seems, because she was the only one with money. Um, although I'm sure that they were friendly as well with the people who started it. Um, it's hard to know when they first met each other, uh, the Vita Scudder and Catherine Coleman and some of the other women. Okay, let's move on to Cedar Hill. Here we are. This was um, the completed mansion with the mature trees. Cornelia embraced the tradition of respect for the land upon which her ancestors toiled and prospered. She found joy in the land and the outdoors from an early age. Her writings describe her pleasures as a child romping through acres of pastures here, running, climbing the apple and butternut trees and playing in the fields. She inherited her family's Cedar Hill property that included a 200 acre working farm, complete with pastures, cultivated fields, livestock barns and a farmhouse. She opened her home and grounds to the public year round for picnic sledding and bowling, among other activities. At what her brother Ned called Cornelius Temple, her life was immersed within a landscape that she carefully stewarded and enjoyed. The well-maintained grounds of Cedar Hill were planted with specimen trees, shrubs and flower gardens. A prominent marble fountain graced the south sloping, sloping lawn, which was um, recently reconstituted by the uh, Community Preservation Act Fund now in the Girl Scouts. Her life was immersed with all of these uh, details. And you can see the maze there. You can see the cow, cow barns, some of the other barns there on the right, lower hand right. And you can see the mansion, and some of the trees that are planted there. Walking trails led through the woods and orchards and the prominent landscape architect, Arthur Shercliffe, who was one of the, her trustees of the estate had been employed by Cornelia Warren from time to time. And he wrote in a letter, February 7th, 1957, uh, when uh, Patricia Ross was writing a book for the Girl Scouts about Cornelia called Cornelia uh, Cedar Hill Memory. She, uh, Shercliffe wrote, I think Miss Warren was led to appoint me as one of her trustees because I knew the place intimately and would insist that it would be given to persons who could maintain its natural beauty, unquote. To the delight of the town's children, an elaborate arbor vitae uh, evergreen hedge maze complete with a reflecting pool and an observation tower she built was open to the public. And you can kind of see the tower there. Um, when writing about it in an article, uh, Cornelia's own writing, uh, she said she heard about her decision to build a full-scale replica of the Hampton Court maze in 1895. She said, my mind had often turned on the questions of how to adapt my grounds for the pleasure of children, and from such simple matters as swing and seesaw, had reverted to a joyful year in Europe when I was 12 years old, when my father had shown me first the maze at Hampton Court. I remembered my perennial joy in running and my special joy as I raced between the fragrant and mysterious hedges of these mazes. And so in the innocence of my heart, I determined to have a maze of my own, unquote. And she did. Cornelia operated the Cedar Hill Dairy, a hundred head mixed breed dairy farm maintained in immaculate condition and fed from rows of corn and rye harvested on our fertile land. Recognized for its high standards of sanitation and quality at a time when milkborne disease was rampant, Cedar Hill Dairy Farm was a source of pride for Cornelia, who soldier tested and board certified bottled milk in Boston, Cambridge, Brookline and Waltham. In a Boston Daily Globe article, July 25th, 1909, Frank Weeks reports that the walls and ceilings of the large cow barns are washed down whenever needed. The floor and cribs are washed and disaffected twice every week. Look at that sparkling barn. The walls behind the cows are washed and disinfected four times a week. The barn is cleaned three times a day and manure replaced with shavings. The water trough is washed out twice a week, flushed twice daily with pure spring water from the hill, 
probably clematis pearl. The cows are groomed daily, and in summer they are sprayed twice each day with fly killer. The milk from the Jersey, Guernsey, Devon, Devon, Ayrshire, Durham, and Holstein cows was blended together with a wooden paddle when it was poured into the 100 gallon receiver by the immaculate white uniform, quote, milkers. An elaborate process involves straining and bottling the milk, followed by sterilizing the cans and bottles by steam. When Weeks asked Cornelia if all the expense and care taken pays, Miss Warren replied, is the production of certified milk profitable? At the price charged for milk, it does pay and also yields a reasonable rate on capital. And there's the Cedar Hill Dairy Farm float in Waltham. I'm not sure when that was, with the white uniformed milkers. Down here, you'll see the listing of an ad in the Waltham directory for many years. They had an ad, this is the Cedar Hill, Cedar Hill Farm with the manager, Charles Cahill. Um, this is from 1919. Um, it, oh, well, well, the records from the directory from 1919 indicates there were 16 men residing and working, such as 11 farm hands, one farmer, one dairy, one cow man, a milkman, and a milk driver. In 1914 and 1915, the Women's Who's Who of America listed uh, this entry. Cornelia Warren has a milk farm at Waltham, 148 acres with 200 head of stock. The farm certified by Cambridge Medical Improvement Society supplies milk to Boston, Cambridge, Brookline, and Waltham. Some have speculated, I think Anne, Clifford, I was thinking this as well, that the milk delivered to the Dennis House Milk and Hygiene Station was from Cedar Hill, and further that some of the farmhands may have been affiliated with the settlement house in some manner, though we can't document that as yet. The need for sanitary milk production became a matter of increasing importance at the state and national levels within the medical community at the turn of the century because of high infant mortality among bottle-fed babies. The Cambridge Medical Improvement Society on Mass Ave in Cambridge, organized in 1906, was among the first in Massachusetts to become involved with the milk commissions. On December 28, 1910, the Boston Daily Globe listed Miss Cornelia Warren as council member of the Milk and Baby Hygiene Association that was led by the president emeritus of Harvard University, Dr. Charles Elliott. Um, this is a um, milk bottle, um, probably from the last year, I believe, of Viva. Um, thinks that the date stamped on it indicated it was probably 1920. And this is the certified seal with the T indicating um, the bottling company and distributor. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. I think my computer fell asleep. So conclusion. By the way, there's the original fountain. I believe it's original. It was supposed to have been made out of marble, stone of some sort. Um, that is also a brass um, impression of the design uh, of the maze that the Girl Scouts made. And this is a listing of some of the um, 200 acre properties uh, that she gifted to um, the various organizations through her trustees. There's an, some of the, some of one event at the, at the, on the lawn with the fountain in front of her house. So to conclude, born on her family, Cedar Hill Estate, March 21st, 1857, Waltham's greatest benefactor, Cornelia Lyman Warren, left an enduring legacy to the public benefit in the form of significant land grants and generous financial bequests to individuals and institutions. Cornelia's life was devoted to improving social welfare and advocating for progressive causes. One of the richest women in Massachusetts, she contributed the wealth she inherited from her father's prosperous paper manufacturing business to numerous charitable endeavors over decades. 
Her altruism had significant impact across a broader array of social issues in which she was actively engaged for her entire adult life until she fell ill. Sharing her fortune in many ways, she famously opened her Beaver Street home and grounds to the public year round for picnics, theater plays, sledding, or bowling alley, among other activities. An astute businesswoman, she operated a hundred head dairy farm, maintained an immaculate condition and recognized for its high standards uh, when an, at a time when milk borne disease was rampant. And this was a source of pride for her. From Beaver Street to Beacon Hill, from Waltham to Westbrook, Maine, Miss Warren left a trail of good deeds, both small and large, with each new detail revealed in obscure texts, archive letters, newspapers, and related accounts of her life. Evidence mounts that hers was a life of distinction, deserving of recognition. A full explanation of her unique life is yet to be written, but her altruism was both notable, notable and impactful. She embodied the principles of her faith, her social conscience, and her status as an independent woman of power in an era of change. Now 100 years after her death is a fitting moment for her hometown of, town of Waltham to pause, to look back with gratitude on the honorable life of the amazing Miss Cornelia Warren. Miss Warren was not a breezer. This is just another record here she was involved in. Th thank you to Mort. This is the uh, family plot at Mount Auburn. And there she is. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dee. That was, that was awesome. Um, one of the things that uh, happens when someone does a great job like that is there are not a whole lot of questions <laughs> here. Um, yeah. You answered all the questions before they could be asked. Um, which of the buildings we saw in the photos are still standing? Uh, not the mansion. I believe that was taken down around 1955. It became economically quite a burden for the Girl Scouts. Uh, other people can jump in if you want to unmute um, Rachel. Um, there are some ladies from the Girl Scouts, I believe. Um, the barn collapsed. Uh, the, the barn at the um, Lawrence Meadow collapsed. Uh, the university did not have the funds to keep that from disrepair. Um, some buildings, uh, other buildings, uh, there were a couple of small outbuildings also uh, that were calving barns and some, a lot of the dairy facilities um, on the Lawrence Meadow side are no longer there. The farm dairy farmhand house is still standing. Um, does anyone else have uh, any that? I know the, um, the uh, Hammond house is there, the original uh, older house was moved onto the Warren property up on the hill there. Yeah. Mary, Marie might know. Marie may pronounce, yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, uh, Dee, if I could just ask you to stop your screen share so we can all chat, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Now, I, I actually had a question, if you don't mind. Uh, the portrait of Cornelia Warren that we see so often is such a beautiful portrait. And I was curious, do we know if that background and the staircase are at the Warren house or do we know where she was for that? And I was also curious if she was so young, did the whole family get their portraits painted at that point? Do we know if there are her mother, her mother and her father did it. I, I suspect it was when she, um, in 1871, she probably got to a certain level in her education prior to taking those tests for secondary education. Um, they took a trip to Europe in 1871 when that portrait was made. And I know her mother and her father both had their portraits take, painted. I don't know if the same artist painted them or not, um, but her brothers and sisters, her brothers would have been elsewhere at the time. Yeah, so it was, it was yeah. like a graduation photo, so to speak. <laughs> I'm wondering, I think so, you know, it was kind of, uh, I think it might have been uh, for women and uh, families of her error. Uh, for instance, the John Singer Sargent painting in the museum, that huge painting yeah. of um, Mrs. Fisk, Rachel uh, Fisk, it was her sister-in-law and uh, uh, Gretchen, Gretchen Osgood, 
uh, Fisk, Warren, um, Fisk, Warren, Fisk was the husband, her brother. His wife is the woman who's a beautiful painting with her daughter. So that was not unusual to spend some money getting your paint, your portraits done. That portrait is gorgeous. I would love to see the original in person someday. I don't know. Do you know if yeah. it's accessible to the public? Oh, yes. Yes. It's very prominently displayed at, at Davis uh, Museum at Wellesley College. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Wayne, could I ask a question? Sure. Sure. Um, Dee, I thought that was just tremendous talk. Uh, I mean, the research and the study uh, you, you have done Thank you, uh, is obvious and is terrific. Well, if I could, I'd just like to make two or three comments and then ask you um, a question. Um, having been a stamp collector in my youth, but uh, not something that I continued, I was fascinated by your slide of the silk coat paper. Now, I must admit, I no longer quite remember what silk coat paper was, but the Warren Company wanted to get a contract to have the um, post office department print stamps um, on their paper. And I think this is around the 1920s. Um, and you may, you may be aware of this story. And so S.D. Warren did trials um, of, of, of printing the, the stamps on this paper. And somehow, uh -huh. some of the trials got released um, into, the, into the mail system. And so one of the great 20th century stamp rarities is to find a silk coat paper. Um, I guess another thing, it was wonderful that you brought up that 1857 agricultural fair. And I think um, describing it as, as perhaps the apex of Waltham's agricultural history, because my colleagues on the, um, on the society know that, uh, that I've been working on um, the Walker family who owned the Gore estate. And it was, it was at that particular fair that a dear, Mr. dear Theophilus won uh, for his pears and his apples and everything else. And the society, I think, has materials on that, uh, on that particular uh, fair that are, that are really quite fascinating. And now, uh, I guess my last comment is, is the ignorance of a teenager. When I was a teenager, um, some friends and I were, were driving to Maine and we stopped in, in Westbrook to get gas. Now, I know that this is hackneyed and, and probably three quarters of the people here have heard this. Oh, it got muted. Everybody. It, here I am, this city kid. You know, and, and Maine was still a long way from Waltham, right? I mean, Maine in our youth, I mean, that was another territory. So I'm the city slicker, right? Uh, uh, so we get off the gas station right on the outskirts of Westbrook and the paper mill smell is significant. And so what does the 18 year olds say? Gee, to the to because you have a, a guy is doing the gas, right? No self-service. So and he was a real mainer, right? The genuine. So I said, gee, what does that smell like? And and you know the answer, which right. put me in my place. He, uh -huh. he only said one word, money. Uh -huh. and, <laughs> and that's that stayed with me all my life. Well, uh -huh. um my question is, could you tell us a little more about Cornelia's brothers? Because I think oh. two of them really had a very interesting lives yeah. that, that come back and, and touch some of our uh, um, 
themes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, where to start? I will just give you a thumbnail. I did do a lot of research. There is a thesis written about Edward Perry that has an enormous amount of information about him. He was the um, connoisseur for initiating in most of the major Northeast colleges, their classical Greek and Roman antiquities departments, including the Boston Museum. Uh, when he started collecting, they didn't have the laws that they have now about transferring you know, property, intellectual property, property from other countries. And he was able to snatch up with his money and actually got in debts a couple of times. The family had to have meetings and bail him out. Lots and lots of antiquities, pieces of um, Greek vases and urns. And he became quite the scholar in that field. He graduated, they all graduated from Harvard. He was a homosexual. He was very much into that kind of lifestyle. He left Harvard. He didn't feel that it was conducive to his, his uh, cultural needs. And he moved to uh, uh, Oxford uh, in London, where he spent most of his life. And um, his, his contribution to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts basically established them as one of the preeminent um, institutions for researchers to study that period. Um, hit one of his partners, one of his partners during his life was the collector and had a similar role for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, John Marshall, um, who actually was married to someone that was a cousin of his, I believe. In any case, um, so that's a whole story, fascinating story um, about, they call him Ned instead of Edward Perry. Um, his brother, oh, the oldest brother, Sam, named after his father, was a lawyer at Harvard. Um, he took over the business when the mother died and they put a, a trust together. His partner was Louis Brandeis, Supreme Court, Brandeis University. We have more connections than you would believe in this family. Um, also one of the few people who would affiliate himself professionally with a Jewish person in this time, at that time, that was not done in some of the Brahmin community, um, Boston wealthy community, um, but they were partners. Um, in any case, Samuel became a trustee of the Boston Museum before it even moved to Huntington Street and was the one who um, took over the building and the financing of the Huntington Street Museum of Fine Arts. So just picture that huge enterprise. I think it took five years to build. So his brother brought artwork. He took over the, um, the building financing uh, of the, the structure and his mother contributed some paintings. Um, uh, unfortunately, Sam, and again, this is just a thumbnail, um, they had a falling out between him, his brother Ned, particularly the one in England, who thought that the estate was chipping him after a while, getting the money he was due from the trust. And make a long story short, um, it was a very public battle ending in court. And Sam eventually shot himself. It was a suicide. They covered it up at first, but it has come, it did come out. And it was something that was very disturbing to the family dynamics, including Cornelia. Cornelia cut her brother out of the will, Ned, because she disagreed with that court challenge and all of that. She tried to be the peacemaker. Um, but Sam had a um, notoriety because he wrote with um, Louis Brandeis, but I guess it was mostly his idea about the right to privacy um, notion, which was for the time a revolutionary idea that people had a, a right to privacy. So that's him. Um, the brother Henry, um, it was a very sad story. Henry, who was um, the scholar of Sanskrit studies, Buddhist texts, who learned, uh, he was a poly, uh, polyglot. He, was a, he knew many, many languages that came very easily to him, but he pursued um, the study of ancient Burmese and Sanskrit text and um, 
uh, the volumes, there are now 93 volumes in the Harvard Oriental Studies book. By the time um, Charles Lannan died, there were 43 volumes and, and um, Henry financed that with $15,000 bequests when he died. He lived at Harvard at the Warren House. He was very um, disabled and in pain his whole life uh, because he got thrown from a carriage that Susan was driving. The horse's knees buckled on Waverly Street which was Quince Street back then. And, and he went flying over the carriage, hit his head. And it wasn't too long after that, that he had neurological issues, spinal issues. And yet he, he was able to learn, graduate from college. He, he needed more and more support as he grew older. And he couldn't even get into the bed by himself. He had to rig up these structures. Um, and so he moved into Harvard and um, till he died. Um, but he is known as a scholar uh, of like the very first one in Southeastern Asian translations into English. So that's an interesting record. And then Fisk, Fisk who lived in Harvard, Mass, and whose wife was the one who John Singer Sargent portrayed. He was kind of a bohemian hippie. He believed in the single tax. He was like an anti-capitalist thinker in terms of economics. And he started a couple of colonies, one in Harvard called Tahanto, one in Andorra, uh, in, in uh, France and in, in, um, in the mountains of the Pyrenees, uh, basically to try to get this single tax system implemented with shared communal kind of uh, concepts. And he had one up in Maine, um, uh, right outside of Westbrook. Um, all of the family to one degree or another did contribute to uh, Westbrook. One of them, Ned took over library, finding books, and Fisk built some housing there. Um, and uh, so that's just a little, a little bit. There's, there's a, and, um, if you're interested in reading the book, Martin Green wrote the Mount Vernon Street um, Warrens uh, uh, of Mount Vernon Street. It has a lot of information about them. And I think he cast Susan in a little harsh light. I, they had a lot of tragedies. Um, Susan, when she was nine years old, living in West uh, Western Mass at Blanford, Doris sent her to live 12, 13 miles away in exchange for Dr. Jones and Mrs. Jones's son, because he thought that little Susan would get a better education and that this little boy, nine-year-old boy would come and live with Hannah and him and his family, Doris's family. But Susan was abused and mistreated and dirty. And there's a whole account in the memorial to my mother, of my mother, that Cornelia writes that her mother shared with her. There was a boy who liked her, a fat boy, and she didn't like him. They're just This little girl was quite traumatized, I think. And finally, the grandmother insisted that she go back. But she would... It's such a history there. Someone, some is aspiring and um, historians, we hope will pick up the threads here. Well, one, one of the things that having been working with Dee a little bit here, um, Dee has so much information. I was hoping that we'd be able to ask her to come back and do another <laughs> presentation. I know that's the last thing you want to hear right now after doing it. Well, I'm ready. I think my husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to keep everyone on a, on, a, on a happy path and keep everyone uh, engaged, but you, you have so much knowledge and we really know how much you, you cut down your presentation <laughs> to accommodate uh, tonight's time. So I, I want to thank you so much for that. And if you would agree to at some point in the future, uh, join us and, and give us a, a little bit more on that subject, that would be awesome. That would be absolutely awesome. Now, uh, Betty McKenzie had a couple of comments. I don't know whether you wanted to say anything, Betty, about... Uh... Uh, oh, I, I just commented on where uh, the existing buildings uh, still are standing at Cedar Hill. Um, the cow barn, the calf barn, the great hall. Well, the, the great hall, as it's now called, was the cow barn. There's, yeah, so... Um, and then the carriage house is still standing and what had been the uh, bowling alley is still standing. They have different, some of them have different names now. Um, and I guess, I mean, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that those of us who've been researching uh, Cornelia and benefiting from all the things that Dee finds and occasionally we find something too, 
you know, the work is not done. Uh, you know, um, I mean, we, we aren't professional historians, but Cornelia is just so remarkable. Uh, and I think we had no idea uh, of, you know, starting this, that, that it will be, it will be years forward uh, for, before we're feeling even a little more settled about this. And, and Dee, of course, gets a well-deserved break. Um, but the Girl Scout Museum hopes to be able to put a lot of the documents that we have online. That was the other thing that I was going to mention. So I'm not sure what the final uh, setup will be in, in terms of organizing that. Uh, but other people in the museum team know more about that than I do. So we, we have discovered a few things that were not readily available. Uh, what, what else, uh, Dee? Uh, I did want to mention that uh, Councillor Darcy had introduced a resolution last fall, I believe, or this winter, honoring, uh, asking the city to honor Cornelia and perhaps to um, think about creating a sculpture. I mean, if you look around at the monuments in our town and what things are named after, we don't see too many women. When we look at the value of the land itself, of all of the individual lives, um, even uh, I was trying to count like how, how could we figure out a person's, quantify a person's value? I mean, how many people have used the, the Waltham Field Station in a hundred years or the Girl Scouts every year? I think it's 13,000 girls use it every year for a hundred years. Um, that's because the land was offered and the land was always meant to be used for the public, whether it was a particular group or not. And then, um, so that's one thing. Within her will, um, that's another thing that's very interesting because she left, she left money to individuals. Some of them she gave them a one-time payment and some of them she decided to give money until they died. There were many of them that got per annum a certain amount of money. Some of them, the, her gardener and her, um, the Charles Cahill, the dairy foreman, she not only gave them their houses to live in as long as they wanted to, but to educate their children. If their kids decided to go to college, she would pay for that. She had a formula to work out of all of the workers who worked for her, they would get a certain proportion probably allocated depending on what rank they were or how, how long they worked for her in her will. She went to that extent, everybody got something. Um, she bought the, the house for Helena Dudley and Euph Euphemia, um, Euphemia uh, Macintosh, who worked uh, at the Denison House, Helena Dudley worked as head worker, was a, a, a stable person there beyond the head worker 13 years, 12 years. But when she supported the Bread and Roses strike and the um, strikers who led that, she had to resign because they were getting some um, negative um, feedback. Uh, from the funders, some of the wealthy funders didn't like the fact that they were supporting the labor strikers in uh, Lawrence. So Helena Dudley had to resign, but um, she had no place to live. So Cornelia gave her or had a house built and it's the house right near the entrance to Bentley College. As you go up the hill on the right, this is White House that um, Betty helped track. So um, to commemorate, some tangibly commemorate Cornelia Warren would be a lovely thing to do in the city. Well, that's awesome. And, and I think you folks can see what I mean when I say Dee has so much more that she's going to. Um, uh, I'm hoping that we can have another presentation, Dee. And I, I wanna note too, you mentioned uh, Councillor Darcy. Councillor Darcy and Councillor McMenamin uh, joined us tonight. I wanna thank them as well for their work with Waltham's history and making sure that um, we do what we can to preserve as much of it as possible. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank everyone else that joined us this evening. I don't know if there are any more questions. I think Rachel and I tend to hang around until everyone gets tired. Uh, bedtime comes for us sometimes earlier than it used to, but um, we're more than welcome to, you're more than welcome to hang around online and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Dee, wonderful job. Um, thank you. Rachel, thank you very much. And uh, if there are no more questions, I'll let people just unmute themselves and have conversation if you wish. That was awesome. It was really awesome. Thank you so much. And I guess I have a quick question for Dee and, and maybe Betty can help answer. Uh, I live around the corner from, from the 
Warren property and the field station and the Girl Scout Museum. And uh, I see that the fountain has been, looks like it's been worked on recently. It's been covered up. And I wondered if anybody could talk about the fountain and what's been happening with it. it it's such a beautiful fountain. And I'd also like to add that I would love the idea of honoring Cornelia Warren somewhere in the city, maybe at the playground or we can all discuss that later. I love that idea. But mm -hmm. do you know what's happening with the fountain? Uh, my understanding is that because the property has been closed, that they have not been using it as it, you know, it's an expense to run the water and all of that kind of stuff and have people maintaining it, uh, Rachel. Okay. Um, I, yeah, it's, uh, but, uh, you know, that's a, a Community Preservation Act project. Um, so I very much look forward to having it uh, un unveiled and opened up again. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful fountain. I believe it's an exact replica. Did they restore it? Did they do some It was work? restored thanks to the Community Preservation Act of Waltham. Uh, I mean, Community Preservation Committee. Yeah. That's wonderful. I've, yeah. I've driven by there and been there many times, Girl Scout myself. So that's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Someone wanted to know, it's six, number 67 Mount Vernon Street. They own that house for 30 years. Someone asked what number it was in Boston. There are um, several books that feature uh, Cornelia. Uh, one of the great ones was by Anastasia Weigel, I thought, who was uh, wrote for the, she worked at the Warren Library in Maine. And there's, you know, several pages about Cornelia specifically, as well as the rest of the family. Um, so those are around and the uh, Waltham Library has, which books does the library have, Dee? Uh, I haven't been there for so long and I took out, um, I think they have the Cedar Hill Memories and they may have um, a memorial to my mother. I don't know, Marie, if you know which ones are in the, the Waltham room. Yeah. Um, there, there's been several, ser I just want to mention to folks, there have been several decades series of people at the Girl Scout facility, uh, the Girl Scout organization who researched Cornelia and her family. So there are folks in the 20s who knew her and celebrated her birthday, I think in, I think it was 1927. But then there was this really interesting uh, project in the 50s and a book came out in 1958 by Dorothy Prescott, a small book. It was printed by the Warren Paper Company, but what we discovered is that there are letters uh, from some of the family members to Dorothy Prescott. So to Fisk, you know, from Fisk Warren's daughter, uh, Rachel, uh, to Dorothy uh, and so forth. So that was one, the, the 57, 58 communications are unbelievable. And then as Dee just held up Cedar Hill Memories, Pat, Ro Pat Ross and Diane White really did an outstanding job on that in around 2000. I'm not sure of the exact no. date, but that has many wonderful photos. One thing people, what we really need are to get Cornelia's journals. She kept journals and they would be such an artifact for us to have. Betty is trying to work on that. The Girl Scouts have been in communication with the relative who owns them in California. We feel that there's a small window of time when those can be accessed and hopefully put into some sort of archive, special collections. So it, at some point, we may request a letter from the Historical Society as to their support for trying to acquire or protect the, her journals. Um, D? Uh-huh. Um, her middle name, you might have said this, and I had to leave the room. Um, Cornelia's middle name was Lyman. Yes. And I was wondering if there was some connection with the Lyman estate those Lymans. They are all related. You know, they all go back, all those families. And after a while, I got pretty confused with who uh, Anne may know, Anne Clifford may know who was, um, you know, uh, cousins married, other cousins. So yes, I, I have no doubt that there's some linkage, just as they were related to the initial settlers in Watertown, the Warrens. 
And um, as far as the Lyman's, that came up from um, various, I think, um, somebody, somebody's married to a George, I think it's George Warren Lyman, but yes, there are connections. Maybe that could be, uh, you know, if people have questions, please email me because we're interested in the questions as well as the answers that people have. You know, we would like to be able to put these and get other people involved because this research, a lot can be done by other people and we can just put it all together. So please, we can coordinate. That would be great. Dee, could I just ask you, uh, how did Cornelia uh, become connected with Wellesley College? Well, through Catherine Coleman, but also through her tutors um, who married Alice Freeman. So George, her, George uh, Palmer, who tutored her, um, ended up marrying Alice Freeman, who was the president for 13 or 10 or 13 years for Wellesley College. And, but I don't know what came first, whether she was friendly with Alice. You know, the, the women who were involved in the College Settlement Association that formed around 1890 in this area, um, 1889, 1890, we don't, we, we there's so much written about that, that we have to really study like the archives at Smith College, for instance, uh, records are, are everywhere. So, um, I mean, I, we, I, yeah, I know uh, Mrs. Duran um, was uh, very involved in a, in a whole series of, of Boston uh, philanthropies, um, the YWCA, she was one of the original incorporators of the YWCA in Boston. Mm -hmm. And the Y started relatively early on the Pioneer Hotel, which was a YWCA yes. owned facility in Boston for, mm -hmm. for women. And they had a, yes. a dining room or a restaurant mm -hmm. sort of thing where, where, where women could go by themselves. But I'm also, uh, why didn't Cornelia go to Wellesley? Because Wellesley, I think, was, wasn't was Wellesley going by 1970, uh, 19, by 1871 or two? Uh, I no, think, I don't think, uh, well, you know, I there, think, maybe 74, but. Yeah, there were some, it's hard to know why she didn't go there. Um, you know, whether it was her family, her mother was a widow then, there was some sense that her mother wanted her home to come. You know, I think Cornelia took charge of everything once her father died and her mother kind of depended on her a lot. So home tutoring happened. Um, we don't know, the diaries would help us know more about that. Um, but I know that Cornelia knew a lot of these women and were friends, the, the settlement, House women. She she may have met, met Jane Adams because Jane Adams from Hull House in Chicago, famously, uh, Jane Adams came to Denison House when yeah. Cornelia was around. Yeah. Cornelia traveled to um, Europe, and and they often went in groups. Like they they're on the passenger list, you would see other names that I would recognize as friends of theirs. You know, so it was a small group of people, but they. They really um, had a lot of cross, built, you know, cross pollination between them. Uh, I mean, have you found any connections with uh, with my favorite family, the Walkers of the Gore Estate? The Walkers owned the Gore Estate from I think eighteen fifty five to nineteen three, um, and and they were. I mean, the the patriarch was also a mill owner, but but you haven't found any. Any connections? I didn't really. Um, I can't say no. I have to. I could check. You know, as I keep that name in mind. So it's Theophilus Walker, and then his two nieces, um, and they endowed the Walker Art Museum at Bowdoin, which is filled oh. with these enormous. Uh, you were saying vases and things. Well, what? No, now? those. Warren Definitely. and Bowden are, 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 you know, these enormous Mesopotamian uh, things. Um, well, now I, I can tell you, Jeremy, 
That was Ned. Ned yeah. endowed, endowed her brother endowed Bowdoin College, which isn't that far from Westbrook. So it's possible, very possible, that family knew each other. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I hadn't realized quite all the connections. I mean, uh, for my own work, your lecture was very, very helpful. So uh, maybe I, I, I can follow up with uh, by email. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea.